Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Bohemian Rhapsody changed music. It started its life as a musical sketch called The Cowboy Song in 1968, two years before Freddie Mercury even joined Queen. For seven years, he polished it and built it up until finally it was ready for its debut on the band's fourth album, A Night at the Opera. They were so enthusiastic about the song that they made it the album's lead single, but there was some concern from the label about whether the public would be interested in a sprawling six-minute epic with clashing musical influences and no clear chorus. Those those fears were quickly put to rest after DJ and friend of the band Kenny Everett went rogue and began teasing bits of the unreleased song on his program, playing it 14 times in two days and driving a huge demand for this revolutionary new take on what rock music could be. Almost 50 years later, Bohemian Rhapsody is still one of the most unique, beloved rock songs ever made. I've been saving it for a special occasion, and we just recently passed half a million subscribers, so let's take it apart. The song starts like this. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? And I already talked about the role of harmonized acapella intros in rock music in my video on Carry On Wayward Son, link in the description, so I'll keep it brief here. The short version is that they're unusual and difficult to do well, so they tend to be used as a marker that this song is gonna be something special. Of course, Queen did them more than most bands because they were very good at them, but still, when you hear this... Is this the you know you're in for a treat. And Bohemian Rhapsody takes this a step further. While most rock songs with these kinds of intros will just sing the chorus, here we have a complete, unique, minute-long section featuring multiple different approaches to vocal writing. The first of these is pure choral singing. Here, there's no clearly identifiable lead part. He's using closed voicings, which means all the notes are within a single octave, and he's singing in tight harmonies so all the lines are moving with roughly the same shape. Combine that with the fact that because Mercury just multi-tracked his own voice here, it's all the exact same tone, and you wind up with a vocal harmony so thoroughly blended that it becomes almost meaningless to call any one of them the melody. It has a melodic contour, but no definite pitch. So let's look at that contour. It starts like this. Is this the real life? Sitting perfectly still on a beautifully mysterious opening chord. When I'm analyzing a piece of music, I like to start by asking what it's about, because the narrative shapes the music and vice versa. So what is Bohemian Rhapsody about? Well... It's complicated. It might be a story about a murder, or a deal with the devil. It could be a religious, political, or philosophical statement. One common interpretation is that it's Mercury's coming out song, a cryptic exploration of his own queer identity. Polyphonic did a great video on that one, link in the description. But if you ask me which one of these answers is correct, I'd have to say... all of them and none of them. Like many great works of art, Bohemian Rhapsody has layers. It never quite tells you what it is, instead leaving the door open for you to work that out for yourself. And that's extremely intentional. Throughout his life, Mercury refused to explain what the song meant. In one interview, when pushed on it, he responded, I think people should just listen to it, think about it, and then make up their own minds as to what it says to them. And after his death, the rest of the band honored that. In a 2003 interview, guitarist Brian May explained, I have a perfectly clear idea of what was in Freddie's mind, but it was unwritten law among us in those days that the real core of a song lyric was a private matter for the composer. So I still respect that. And I will too. Instead of pushing one particular reading, I'm going to focus on how the song creates so much space for different interpretations, how they build the structure of an epic story without filling in any of the details, and that all starts with the very first chord. Is the notes here are D, F, G, and B flat. These are the notes of G minor 7, but they're also the notes of B flat 6. The way we'd usually tell these two chords apart is by looking at the bass, but here none of these voices are low enough to really sound like a bass part. Besides, the lowest note we do hear is a D, and this is definitely not a D chord. Now, this isn't really an ambiguous tonality. It's gonna become pretty clear pretty quickly that we're in the key of B flat, but what's left unclear is whether or not we start on the 1 chord. The notes are arranged in such a way that either answer feels a little unsatisfying, so we're left with this sort of liminal harmony, a rich, complex chord voicing without a clear root. From there, the line starts to move, Is this just fantasy? with a descending figure spelling out C7. The E natural in this chord creates a tritone with the B flat held over from the last one. It's a pretty striking pair of chords, perfectly encapsulating the duality in the lyrics between real life and fantasy. Real life is vague and mysterious, while fantasy is clear, bright, and powerful. But the C7 isn't just a random chord, it's also a secondary dominant. That just means it's setting up a resolution to somewhere other than the root. Basically, when we hear C7, no matter what key we're in, we expect it to be followed by some sort of F chord, which it is. Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. 
Here they repeat the same melodic contour, sitting basically still in the first bar before walking down in the second. The first chord is F7, another dominant chord, but this time it's the primary dominant, pointing back to the one chord, B flat. This is all a very classical approach to harmony writing, using dominant resolutions to strongly establish a clear, unambiguous key center. In fact, it's way more classical sounding than what most rock bands were doing in the mid-70s, but that's not surprising. Bohemian Rhapsody is meant to sound like a mock opera. They're using the vocabulary of a very specific musical time period that we've all somewhat ironically learned to interpret as timeless in order to tie into the cultural associations we have with that style. Again, it's all about creating a journey, and this harmonic approach provides a clearly recognizable roadmap. After that, we get our next vocal approach, the supported lead. The choir sings this... Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see... But let's be honest, that's not what you sing when you're blasting this song in your car on the way to work. No, you sing this... Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see... Because now we have a clear, separated lead melody. Most of the voices are sitting almost perfectly still, highlighting the similarity between the two chords, but on top, Mercury adds one line that walks down, then back up. By developing a lead melody, he also begins to develop a lead character. We're getting our first glimpse of our narrator's point of view, which he drives home with the line, Open your eyes. And just... I want to take a second to appreciate how beautifully the music and lyrics interact here to create something that's so much more than the sum of its parts. This widening of the musical texture on this particular line is just so clever, and it shows just how much care and attention to detail went into building this song. I love it. This is also where they introduce Mercury's piano. which again helps expand the texture. I'm not going to spend too much time on this piano part yet because it's largely in support of the vocals here, but it's going to become pretty important pretty soon, so I wanted to mention it now. The next line gives us our third vocal approach, the independent lead. Here, the choir shifts from singing along with a lead to simply responding to it. <laughs> creating further separation between the two parts and really letting our main character's voice shine. Harmonically, this whole section is building on the ideas we saw previously. We get G minor, the sixth chord, which the song might possibly have started on, then B flat seven, another secondary dominant, this time pointing to E flat. That's the four chord, then we go two, then five, which points back to one. Just like before, a very simple, recognizable, classical chord progression. But then, something weird happens. Easy come. Easy go, little high, little low. That's not nearly as classical sounding. This is a technique called planing, where you just take a chord voicing and slide it around in half steps. In this case, we're sort of dancing around the B flat chord, taking turns resolving to it from above Easy come. and below. Easy go. In the second half, they even amplify the disorienting effect with some panning shenanigans. Little high, little low. So what's happening here? Well, I think the simplest explanation is that while this takes place in the intro, it's not actually from the intro. This is foreshadowing for a later section. So yeah, keep this in mind. It's gonna come up again... eventually. From there, the intro wraps itself up. with a bass walk down that leads to the five chord, where it hangs for a moment before finally returning to one to start the ballad section. Underneath that, we go back to a supported lead before finally moving on to our last vocal approach, the solo lead. To me. Here, our narrator symbolically leaves the choir behind as he begins to tell his own story. One thing I specifically want to highlight in this song is its transitions. There are six distinct sections, none of which sound all that similar. Now, having six different ideas that sound good isn't that hard. The real challenge is fitting them all together into one coherent song. That means you need not just great sections, but great transitions, and Bohemian Rhapsody has great transitions. Looking at all of them together, the pattern seems to be one of increasing intensity. Early in the song, they're smooth and subtle, while later on they get more obvious and dramatic. This is the first one, though, so it needs to be well hidden. That's why I mentioned the introduction of the piano earlier. It's about to become the star of the show, so sneaking it in partway through the intro as they slowly disassemble the choir helps make this feel not so much like a change, but more like an inevitable conclusion. The ballad follows the intro with very little fuss. The first thing we hear in the ballad is this...
So let's talk about that arpeggio pattern. Specifically, let's talk about those two high notes at the end. He's actually crossing his hands for this part, playing those two notes with his left hand while he maintains the basic chord shape beneath it with his right. And throughout this section, these two notes follow a very specific pattern. The second one is a chord tone, in this case F, but the first one isn't. It's a note a whole step above the second one, sitting outside the chord and resolving back down. This places the tense, non-harmonic tone on beat 3, one of the strongest metric positions, so you really feel how it wants to drop back down to somewhere stable. If I flip them around so it's on beat 4... it loses a lot of its power. He starts by sitting on a B-flat chord, with the high notes resolving from G to F as a nod to that ambiguous B-flat 6 from the start of the song. When the vocals come in, he moves into another relatively straightforward classical progression, going 1, 6, 2, 5, basically the same thing as the intro. In terms of melody, the first thing I want to highlight is the first bar where he sings the word mama in that particular rhythmic pattern on D, the third of the key. That's gonna be relevant in a moment. Beyond that, the big idea here is space. He alternates between short phrases with lots of room in between. Mama just killed a man. And longer runs with small gaps that blend together into a single statement. Put a gun against his head. Pulled my trigger, now he's dead. This gives the melody a sort of push and pull to it as the narrator flips between shock at his actions and panic about what comes next. As the section builds, he starts to lean further and further into the long phrases, providing a sprawling account of the events that transpired, although, again, without enough context to work out exactly what those events mean. The second time through, he starts playing the same progression again, but when he gets to the C chord, he suddenly veers off in a new direction. Now, I could go through and tell you what function each of these chords has in our key, but I'm not gonna, because that's not really what's happening. This whole thing becomes a lot easier to explain if we just listen to John Deacon's bass. He's walking down in half steps with random chords on top. This sets up what I like to call a tension modulation. You see, when you're trying to change keys, there's a couple ways to do it. The two you'll probably learn in music theory class are the direct modulation, where you just start playing in a new key with no preparation, and the pivot modulation, where you smooth it out by using notes and chords that are shared by both keys in order to mask the transition. The tension modulation goes in the opposite direction, using notes and chords that don't belong to either key in order to build up so much dissonance that anything stable is is going to sound like a resolution. The falling half-step line, the unfamiliar chords on top of it, and most of all the sudden addition of an ominous cymbal swell by Roger Taylor means wherever we wind up next will probably feel like a perfectly fine one chord by comparison. But Mercury does give us a clue where we're going. I said the chords on top were random, but that's not quite true. Here, I'll play it again, and I want you to listen to the line at the top of the voicings. Did you catch it? Throughout the whole thing, he keeps playing E flat and G. In fact, that's all these chords are. They're what you get when you combine the moving bass line with a static E flat and G. The fact that they create recognizable named chords is kind of just a coincidence. The insistent repetition of these two notes over the increasing dissonance of the bass establishes them as stable consonant points that your ear wants to return to, and these two notes establish the key of E flat major, so when we finally go to that chord, it feels like home. And in order to really stick the landing, the first bar of the melody is this, mama. with Mercury singing the word mama in that particular rhythmic pattern on G, the third of the key. Told you that'd be relevant. The progression here is pretty much the same 1, 6, 2, 5 that we saw before, but a little more dressed up. Like, we've got this passing chord. There's a little mini walk down over F minor to set up the B flat. And they give the 5 chord a whole bar this time with a big dramatic rhythm. but basically it's the same idea. And that's not surprising. In classical music, it's really common to state a theme or idea, then play it again in a new key, typically either a fourth or fifth away. These keys are harmonically close, but melodically distant. That is, they share a lot of notes, so it's easy to pivot between them, but the roots are pretty far apart, so you wind up in a very different range. Here, Mercury uses that to shift his vocals up into a more powerful register, taking on an almost pleading tone that complements the rise in musical energy. As 
an aside, my favorite flourish in this section happens when he goes to the C minor. In this new key, it's the 6 chord, but it was also present in our last key as the 2 chord, so Mercury ties the two keys together by repeating the same arpeggio pattern. It's a really subtle thing, but it makes such a huge difference. After the tension modulation, it kind of feels like that initial B-flat tonality is lost, but here we see a little piece of it poking through in the arrangement, breaking up the more emphatic structure with something soft and gentle. It's great. Again though, the second statement goes in a different direction. It starts similarly... But as it goes, it fades down in volume and eventually gets interrupted by this A-flat minor chord that glides back to E-flat. If you're a fan of negative harmony, you'll recognize this as an inverted dominant, a sort of dark mirror to a traditional 5-1 resolution, bringing us back to one in a way that feels a little more somber. That leads into this... which is like that tension modulation, but in reverse. He holds an E-flat on top and slides the other two notes down in thirds, slowly melting into F minor 7, which sets up a soft, gentle return to our initial key of B-flat. This leads to a second verse of the ballad section that's fairly similar to the first, but with a bit more sonic energy, thanks to the addition of Taylor's drums. It's a pretty simple groove, but that's all it needs to be. Adding a drum part elevates the second verse to more of a rock ballad as opposed to the musical theater sound of the first verse. It does mean they can't use the cymbals as a surprise during the tension modulation this time, though, so instead that role is filled by May on a distorted electric guitar. Same idea, just with an even larger orchestration, ramping up the intensity of the section even further. When we go back to E-flat, the first half is the same, but instead of starting to wind down and drift back to B-flat again, we get interrupted by a guitar solo. Musically, it's one of the smoothest transitions, since it keeps playing over the exact same chords and orchestration that Mercury was singing over, but structurally, it's a bit surprising, since it comes halfway through a vocal phrase. As for what he's playing, I don't really like to analyze solos note for note, because I don't think that's the point. Solos are improvised, or at least that's the implication. Actually, in this case, May apparently planned it out in advance because, in his words, the fingers tend to be predictable unless being led by the brain. But still, it sounds improvised, and that's how I experience it. So instead of breaking down the exact melody or whatever, I think it'd be more insightful to look at the overall shape and examine the musical vocabulary and specific ideas that it's built out of. The first question to ask is which scale he's using, and fortunately for us, the answer is pretty simple. It's E flat major. He does add in some other notes at the the very end, which we'll get to in a minute, but by and large he's sticking with the basic tonality of the section. Nothing too spicy so far. But the big idea that seems to guide this solo is the same thing we saw Mercury play within the piano pattern, juxtaposing the stable points in the key with more colorful notes a whole step above them. Unlike the piano though, where the tension was played first and then resolved, in the solo May usually goes the other direction, hitting the consonant note first and then sliding upwards. This generally matches the changing harmony so that he hits the dissonant note right as it becomes the root of the new chord, turning it from a harmonic tension into a melodic resolution. The primary pair of notes he plays with here is B flat the fifth and C the sixth. He announces his interest in this relationship pretty clearly at the start of the solo, and then he gives it to us again in the walk-ups. Listen to the notes he walks up to. We also get them the other way around. Over the first B-flat 7, he plays this big walk down, starting on a high C and falling back down to a low B-flat. But it's not all B-flats and Cs. Whenever the band goes to C minor, May plays this figure, using a very specific rhythmic pattern to outline the bottom part of the triad, first walking up to E-flat, the root of the key, before sliding up to F as the chord changes. It's the same approach, just based on the root instead. The first time we hear this is near the start of the solo, where he's mostly been holding notes, so it serves to ramp up the intensity, but the second time it's after those blazing fast walk-ups, so the exact same rhythm now serves as a break, cooling things off and letting you catch your breath. It's a really interesting demonstration of the power of musical context. And he uses this same pattern to help transition into the the end of the solo where the key starts to dissolve. Remember how in the E-flat section the two chord featured that funky little bass walk down? Well, at the end of the solo, that line keeps going, 
hitting every note from F down to B flat. This creates another tension modulation, this time setting us up to resolve to A for the opera section, and May alerts us to the changing tonality by moving that pattern to a new root. This doesn't actually tell us where we're going, cause that's still supposed to be a surprise, but it does tell us that we're going somewhere. In the last bar, the harmony starts on D flat major, a chord borrowed from the parallel minor, and throughout the bar, May leans on the root D flat. This is a really clever trick. D flat major doesn't belong to our target key, but the note D flat does. Or at least C sharp does, but for our purposes they're the same thing, so May is covering up the tension modulation with a pivot tone, a single shared note that ties the two keys together just enough to bridge the gap. This creates our first really noticeable transition. Up to now they've been pretty smooth, but here we see a sudden unprepared change in orchestration as most of the band drops out. <laughs> leaving just Mercury's piano playing staccato chords. It's a striking change, and it marks the point where this song really starts to become something truly unique in the rock canon. But, well, there's a lot of stuff left in this song, and I've already been talking for a pretty long time. I feel like if I try to fit everything into one video, I'm gonna wind up rushing through some really interesting points, so instead, I think I'm gonna stop here and make this my first ever two-parter. I'll be back in a week to talk about the opera section, the hard rock section, and, of course, the ending. If you want to see that when it comes out, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell, do the thing in your notification settings that makes it so it actually sends you the email you signed up for when you hit the bell. God, I hate this website. Oh, and that thing from the intro I told you to keep in mind? Continue to keep that in mind until next week. Trust me, it's gonna pay off. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Heward, Kevin Wilamowski, and Grant Aldonis. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.